There was Iru, the one, who in Arda is called Iluvitar, and he made first the Ainur, the holy ones that were the offspring of his thought, and they were with him before aught else was made. Hey everyone, Yoisten here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today, I was originally going to make a video only speaking to the direct and perhaps indirect times the god in Tolkien's universe, Iru Iluvatar, influenced the world, but instead I figure I might as well do a more well-rounded overall video concerning this character and his lore, despite how meta this video will be. A great thanks to Tolkien Gateway's article on Iru linked in the description, for it provided me with many direct links to many of the specific moments Iru impacted Middle-earth, yet I plan to go into more detail and bring up other commentary not included in the article. But please check that out, as well as the other articles and videos in the description and cards. My friends, thank you so much for joining me today. Let's begin our tale on the story of The One. In the timeless halls before the beginning of the world, there was Iru Iluvatar, whose two names meant he that is alone and the father of all in Quenya. In the thoughts of his mind, he created the Ainur, beings of great power, some of whom would become the Valar and Maiar upon Middle-earth. He created them with the secret fire, the flame imperishable, that which gave true life and free will. The account of the beginning of Arda and the Ainu Lindele is quite similar to the beginning of Genesis, which is worth mentioning from an academic and Tolkienian point of view, for God and Iru Iluvatar obviously share many qualities, and the Ainur share many similarities to the Elohim. Anyway, mightiest of the Ainur was Melkor, who himself wandered the void, wishing to find this flame imperishable so that he could create and rule over creatures of his own. But he would never find it, for it was with and of Iru, and it would eventually be at the heart of the world of Ea. But I get ahead of myself. During the time before time, the Ainur made music, and Iru went on to lead three themes of music. The first was his, and yet Melkor's discords arose, for he wanted to gather much power unto himself. The second theme began with a smile from Iru, amid the storm of the first. Yet Melkor arose again and overpowered it with his discord, dismaying the other Ainur. Finally, with a stern temperament, there was a third theme that Iru transitioned to, and with this theme, the children of Iluvatar were conceived by Iru and came with that third theme. Iru acknowledged Melkor as mightiest of the Ainur, yet would explain that, even in any theme Melkor thought to devise, it had its uttermost source in Iluvatar, and such themes only served Iru's greater purpose. Now, this is very interesting from a philosophical point of view, for it, in a way, solves the problem of evil in Tolkien's works, as Iru acknowledges that though Melkor's power, discord, and perhaps even evil is great, they all had their uttermost source within Iru himself, or at least in his designs, and all of Melkor's actions served such designs in the end. Now these matters of free will and determinism, the problem of evil in Tolkien's works, dualism, and so forth, all probably deserve their own videos, or a single video at least, that dive into these philosophical topics within the world of Arda, but it is worth mentioning here, as Iru would go on to play a very interesting role during the ages of the world, as he influenced, or even was, fate itself, acting more overtly in some situations, and more subtly in others, which we shall discuss more in a bit. After the music, Iru would show the Ainur a vision of at least some of what was to be, yet other parts of the world that were to be were clouded and obscured, potentially due to this free will, or by some other design of Iru as only Iru himself knew the fate of Arda in the end. Then the vision was taken away, and with the casting of the flame imperishable, the created world Ea was thus come, and some of the Ainur descended into forms in this world, becoming Valar and Maiar. And so they set to creating the world as they had seen it in the vision, making it ready for the coming of the children of Iluvatar, elves and men. Iru would continue to watch over his world, and though he would not be nearly as active as he had been during the music of the Ainur, he would still influence events in Arda from time to time. Manwe, who best knew the mind of Iluvatar, and Mandos, who best knew what was and what would be concerning many fates, would be high powers in the name of Iru, all while the other Valar and Maiar, and of course Melkor himself, played their own very important roles in the creation of the world to come. In this way of delegating many of the more active roles in governing the world to the Valar, Iluvatar certainly leaned into a more deist role in some ways, where a deity plays a less overt or completely passive role in the world after setting it up. However, I wouldn't say that Iluvatar was a completely deist figure in that regard, 
as he was still quite active in some circumstances, just not many others. I'll also say that the Valar were similar in this regard, for as the ages went on, they also played less and less active roles, doing far less overall, as I imagine it was with Iluvatar. Now looking at what Iluvatar did as the ages went on, we have those more active and more passive instances, for he would certainly take steps to change Middle-earth forever, yet even invoking his full name would be seen as a holy and rare act by the wise, and was done with caution and temperance, at least in most cases. Sometime into the history of the world, Aule would create the dwarves, yet they did not have true life or free will, not until Iru saved them from the hammer of Aule and gave them true life and free will, adopting them as his own children as well, yet making sure that the dwarves would only awaken after the elves, his firstborn children. Yet after the creation of the dwarves, Yavanna worried for her trees, fearing the axes of those who would be called Kazad. And so Iru allowed for the creation of Yavanna's Ents, continuing Iluvatar's character device of keeping things in balance, all things, good and evil alike. And so, even as the years went on and the elves awoke, some traditions and feasts took place in the honor of Iru, but some elves like Feanor would invoke Iluvatar's name and oath, which would make such an oath be bound to its fate indeed. For men, once they had awoken, they were subject to the gift of Iluvatar, fate that Iru himself had decreed, which made men mortal and made them die in the end. This of course seemed harsh and difficult to many to understand, yet nevertheless mortality served Iluvatar's greater purpose for Arda in the end. Now where Iru became more and more subtle has to do with many of the events that occurred particularly in Middle-earth and not in Valinor, with the rise and fall of the Dark Lords Morgoth and Sauron. Perhaps they only rose and fell due to the subtle and unknowable deeds of Iru. Of course, Iluvatar still influenced, or even was, fate itself, as some Numenorians who worshipped Iru in the Three Prayers knew, those who had dedicated their Mount Meneltarma to him. Yet others who were unwise forgot the power and goodness of Iluvatar, and turned against him and his judgments, especially concerning the fate of death. And so the Numenorians rose up against the Valar in the west, hating the gift of Iluvatar. And the Valar pled to Iru to stop the Numenorians, for the Valar and Meyer in the west were not supposed to harm the children of Iluvatar. And so in this time of 3319 of the Second Age, Iru intervened in Middle-earth in a very active manner, for he brought about the downfall of Numenor, destroying the island that had once been a gift to men. And he ensured that the last king of Numenor, our Farazan and his men were buried on the shores of Amon until the end and the remaking of the world. What's more, in this very active moment for Iru, he actually reshaped the entire world, making it round, and making the straight path to Valinor extremely difficult to find, if not impossible, for those who were not meant to find it. Besides the creation of the world itself, one may argue that this was the most impassive action Iru Iluvatar took in the history of Middle-earth, Yet surely it was something he had known about or intended to do since the beginning, as he had known the fate of Middle-earth and all things in it. Yet still, Iluvatar was worshipped by the faithful and wise, and his power and gift were not taken lightly. Elendil would bind his friendship with Gilgalad and the Last Alliance at the end of the Age in an oath to Iru, and Kirion the Steward in the Third Age would include Iru's name in his oath of friendship with Eorl the Young, Yet certainly other kings and stewards probably included Iru's name in such oaths and promises, thus influencing fate itself in different oaths throughout the years. But in the Third Age, just as the Valar took an even less active role, but likely still influenced small things, like Manwe probably changing the course of the wind during the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, for instance, Iluvatar was also very subtle and removed in his actions, influencing only what was necessary. Perhaps the fate of the One Ring itself remaining in the Anduin until Deagle found it, and its movement of subsequent bearers thereafter was all influenced by Iru. Even as he made sure characters such as Gollum, Bilbo, Gandalf, and Frodo, among many others, were all in the right places at the right time. It's also likely that Iru actually resurrected Gandalf, knowing that he was vital and necessary for the survival of his children in the world. And it's probable that Iluvatar also enforced the fulfillment of oaths, especially those taken in his name, such as the Rohirrim coming to Gondor's aid, or even possibly the Oathbreakers aiding Aragorn at Pelargir in the late part of the Age. 
Thus, it is even likely that Iru Iluvatar reinforced the dooms Faramir and Frodo set upon Gollum, saying that Gollum's end would come upon him if he should betray and hurt Frodo, which he did, and sure enough, Gollum fell into Mount Doom, as many have speculated that it was actually the force of Iru himself which pushed the dancing Gollum into the fires. This is entirely possible, as Iluvatar, as well as potentially Mandos and others, gave oaths, fates, and dooms their power in Arda, as I speak about in a different video of mine. And so it was with the end of Gollum and the Ring, the time for the diminishment of Iru's firstborn children had come, and it became time for the rule of Iru's second children, men, even while his adopted children, dwarves, would later disappear from the known world. Of course, after the end of the Third Age, we cannot be quite sure of Iluvatar's deeds in the world, though it is likely that, just as he had reinforced fate and oaths and influenced small things here and there to make the world be as it was during the Legendarium, he would continue to do these things, yet becoming more and more removed from taking an active role in the world, at least until the Dagor Dagroth, and Melkor's return, and the final end of the first world of Arda. For after this, Iru would once more create a second music of the Ainur, but this time with the aid of his children as well, remaking the known world of Ea, as Iru Iluvatar would never abandon Arda, nor his children, and the Ainur. And so we come to the end of our tale on what we know about the history of Iru Iluvatar the One. From this tale, we see that, as it concerns fate and our larger place in the world, we know very little. We must trust in what we do know and what we do not know, and that we will play the roles we are meant to play. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this tale. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button and share this with a friend. What are your thoughts on the history and deeds of Iluvatar and how they impacted Tolkien's Legendarium? Let me know in the comments below. I find Iru to be a very interesting insight into Tolkien's philosophy about metaphysics, fate, and even his own faith. Not to say that Iru was entirely accurate to all things Tolkien believed, but to at least some of the ideas he did have. Thanks to our Valar tier patrons, Adrian De La Tour, Chris Ortner, Kyle Wetzel, Peter Shepard, Jonathan Putin, and Mark Kralik, Blair Scout, Merton, John Hume, Sam McBee, Matt Zabach, Elizabeth Calvert, Maz Gibbs, Ben Gardner, Condar, Reese Jenkins, Anna Petrolik, Kuzan, Brandon Glidden, Daniel Burns, Anthony Harmon, and Dorwin Gray. Thank you so much, and thanks to all of our patrons and YouTube members. The support means a lot. Please subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the free peoples today. And I'll see you all again next week with a video on the history of Dol Guldur, Fortress of the Necromancer. You all are the best, my friends. Thank you so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one.